Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where this week I don't have any crazy new announcements, which is weird. It's been a while since I've not had a crazy new thing that I had to look into. Um, it's kind of inspired by one of the announcements a little bit while ago. So we saw the announcement of this thing called Redash, a whole dashboarding technology that Databricks have purchased and are planning on jamming inside the whole Databricks workspace, which is really, really cool. However, people don't really talk about how cool it already is inside of Databricks. And that, for me, it's, it's a shame because there's loads of really, really cool stuff that we can do. So I've been doing a lot of training for some engineers, some data scientists, a lot of the meat and the partitioning and the dirty stuff under the hood of Spark, but also for some data analysts. And it kind of made me think, you know what? I should probably share with some more people about how good Databricks is for the straightforward data analyst. You want to get at some data, you want to write some SQL, you want to join some things together and just get some results. And the data viz that's baked in is better than you think. So we're going to go run through some of the basic data viz. We're going to build a dashboard, which we can already do inside of Databricks, but it's kind of hidden away a little. So come with me, we'll have a look at how it works and we'll take it from there. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you like the video. And of course, get back to me with any questions, comments, let me know how you get on. Okay, so here we are inside Databricks. I've got one of our training notebooks. So one of the notebooks that we train people on, and uh, we just kind of run them through it, and this is something they take away and they can play with in their own time and all that kind of stuff. So how do visualizations work? So there's a few things in here. Um, I don't know if we'll get to some of the custom libraries, but let's see what we've got. So I've just got a data frame. Super simple. It's from the Databricks data sets. So there's a load of baked in data sets uh, to every single Databricks cluster. Um, Databricks use it for training. It's great sample data just for learning how Databricks works. So I'm using one of those. We're bringing it into a data frame. And we're going to display it. Now you can see it below. We've displayed that data frame and I get a grid of data. And it's like, uh, okay, I've got some data and I can sort it, I can play around. And again, that's why the display function is definitely better than the show function. So you can do dataframe.show when it does the vanilla spark ASCII art style table, but display, you know, I can, I can still sort things, play around, copy it. It's okay, but quite hard to see data like that. That's why we got that little button. So we have a make it into a chart for me button, which is already just out of box. It's cool. Baked into your notebooks. Everything already has that turned on. So by default, you can do visualization on anything that displays data, be that a Python data frame, I've hit put a display around, or even some SQL. I could be in a SQL notebook doing nothing but writing SQL all the way down, and anytime I return a result set, I can hit that button, turn it into some kind of visual. So that's nice. But I found these the other day, and I've gone a long time using Databricks, and kind of hadn't even noticed that these various options were there. So on some of the more legacy types of charts, so it's not there on some of the fancy ones, like your, um, your world maps and that kind of thing, but your basics, your columns, your scatters, all that kind of stuff, you get all these, which is cool. So I can do things like download it as a PNG. Now my laptop's been going weird. Will this let me actually open it? Yeah, I will. So we can just download those as a picture. So you no longer have to do clippings and take screenshots and things, just download it. We can zoom in. So I can say, actually, what's all that number down there? Oh, that's nice. I can just kind of have a play around um, with the data. I can pan instead, so I can kind of zoom it around if I am zoomed in. I can do a box select and say, just highlight a few things on there before I export it, or even a lasso select, which again on the scatter, that took what, Power BI? How many years to put in? And yeah, it's not doing the cross filtering. It doesn't have the drill downs. It's not a fully fledged advanced BI tool, but some of the basic functionality that they've got baked into the visuals that you can just have in a notebook are actually really cool. Okay, other things that we can do. Oh, we can zoom in and out manually rather than clicking on it. That's fine. We can have it scale. It's that secret little button for scaling up and down if you want to have a play with it inside the thing, which is kind of nice. Um, and then we've got these things. So I can do spike lines. So that's whenever I'm highlighting something, do I want it to get just like appear all the way across the chart, which gets just a little nicety that you don't normally get in this kind of thing. And then how do I want it to work in terms of those hover overs? So just tell me the thing I'm on, or tell me the categories separately. Give me the more contextual information whenever I'm hovering. So that's, that's pretty cool. That's got a lot of stuff in there. Uh, and again, we can do different types of charts. It might be the same one, um, but there's more things we can do. So this is a different data set. I've just hard-coded some data in there. 
And we can do this kind of thing. So a clustered bar chart. And how do we do that? So this is just the straightforward bar. It's like, I would like a bar chart, please. And the way you do it is this plot options button. Kind of, you know, if you use Excel to make charts, this is going to be super familiar. This is just, again, a nice little viz um, configuration box. So we're saying, okay, I want to group by category. I want to have years long the bottom. I want values to be my sales amount. I can change it around, can change whether it's stacked or grouped. Uh, make it 100% so of the big long flat ones. It just has um, ratios. Just lots of stuff we can do, which is actually quite nice. And you want it to aggregate things. But be careful with the aggregation that we're telling you, because it's, it's being fed the results of our data frame. So in our data frame, if we've worked out the average, and then we tell it to sum the average, that's going to get very confused. Um, so it's, it's fairly blunt. It's just saying, whatever you hand me as a visual, I'm going to turn into um, this data viz. But it does mean you can do some funky stuff, which is cool. Got this little funky button. Global color consistencies. That means across the whole notebook, if it's checking out the different values, so if it sees the same categories across all the different data visualizations you've done, it'll make sure they've got the same color. Now that it does it programmatically. So if you have loads and loads of different categories, lots of them are gonna be very similar colors. They are unique colors, but it might be off by one or two RGB values. It's gonna be quite close, but still pretty cool that you can just turn that on to have consistency across all the different things in your notebook. Awesome. Really, really cool. Okay, other things we can do. Um, you know, we can do, oh, we can do scatter charts. Uh, we can do line charts. We can do things. We got all that kind of same functionality all working on there. Uh, we can do, who does not love a pie chart? Um, pretty much everyone, but still, but they're in there. You know, and that's the kind of just real basics kind of covering all the boxes. For this stuff, if we've got either US states, or we've got a uh, world country code using the ISO three letter country code, then you can just get a nice little tactile geo map that has the data in there. And it's, it's not doing anything ticky fancy. It's not doing any cross filtering or stuff, but just to have that baked in, in the notebook, as soon as you just turn it on, it's automatically got all that stuff. It's again, it's just quite nice. It's, it's better than you would expect it to be baked into uh, a notebook. The get go. So we've got the same, but going with countries. It automatically works out it's the world map. Again, that just, it assumes that the first column is going to be an ISO two code country, uh, a two code state or a three code country. Um, and then it builds it from there. We can do a scatter plot, make something kind of cool. There's just lots of things that we can do. And it goes kind of uh, fairly deep in terms of what you can build in terms of some of the more scientific visualizations. So if you're doing things like looking at, um, you know, rock curve, that kind of thing, the accuracy of a data science model, um, you've got all that kind of stuff baked in, and then you can even further go down, go and start talking at things like uh, Matplotlib, Seaborn, uh, Plotly, that kind of thing. And you can just call those. You need to be a little bit careful with those libraries because they, although it looks like they can just take a data frame, normally you have to do something like convert it in Pandas, and that doesn't scale probably across your workers. So it's always kind of like you need to work out your data, aggregate it to a, like, a nice summary level, so basically use the Spark clusters for doing all the crunching and then take your results and then pass that to some kind of database. But that's the case, same kind of way we work if we're passing it to a BI tool, if we're passing it to, if we pulled it down to Excel to work with, you wouldn't want to take down millions and millions and millions of rows locally. You'd want to say, can you aggregate the data for me? And then I'm going to put it into some kind of visual. So it makes sense. Okay, so all those bits put together, that's, that's all right, but it's, it's kind of hard to read. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. And one of the things that I never, never see people use is the fact that they've got different ways of viewing a notebook. So right here, under this little view dropdown, I can say, you know what, results only. Get rid of all the code. Shorten up, make it look like there's no cells. I want to see this like it was a Word doc. So you can then just skip through and it just feels much more like you're just reading a document. You're reading someone's results of everything they went through with their nice little markdown annotations. And it's just, it's just nicer. So that's, that's one thing. You've just plain results for you is quite, way, uh, quite a nice way of doing it. Or you've got the side by side. The, I want to give someone kind of a reading pane and put that side by side with my code. So if it finds any markdown, if it finds any visualizations, if it finds any output, it'll put that to one side. And then on the other side, we just get our code. 
I'm gonna scroll down and kind of just, it's almost like the, which channel do you wanna read? You can be reading the results and go, how do they do? Oh, it's that code, okay. And it's almost like a reference, but it means you're not getting the jarring pulling out of bit of code, then some visualization, bit of code interpretation, code interpretation. You're getting this nice channel for how it works. But I hear you say, that's still not good enough because I still have to scroll all the way down to see all my different visualizations. I don't want that. I want a one pager. I need to give something to my exec and say, look, there's the page that tells you everything that's going on. And that's when you have this crazy little button hidden over here, which you know, they could make more obvious, which is the, I want to have this in a dashboard. I want to make a new dashboard. And it just pins it into a new dashboard object. So this is going to be my advancing Spark dashboard. And that just has pinned that visual. I can have a play around with it, I can resize it, I can do what I want with it. And it doesn't resize amazingly in this case. Come on, you can, you can, no, it's already going down. Okay, fine. Uh, but lots and lots of things we can do. So if we go back, if we just kind of uh, go back onto our standard view and just head down here and pin various things, I'm gonna re-pin that to my dashboard. I go down and say, what do we want? We want to have this pinned in. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want that to go in there. I want to see my line chart. Let's get that in my dashboard. And yeah, you're building up, essentially, tagging objects that you want to appear in there, which is quite nice. Uh, so let's do that as a final one, and then go over and say, what's on my dashboard? Okay, yeah. so it's building up all these different charts I'm asking for. Again, I can go into each one and do the settings and have a play about how it should work. Uh, I can step back into the notebook and do my full configuration for it. And it's just kind of linking them up. And it's, it's super basic. It's not meant to be a replacement for Tableau, for Power BI, for all that kind of stuff. But it's just a free, out of the box thing you get if you've got your notebooks in there. We've got a little presentation mode where we can just share that as a link straight to it. And we've got an update button, which I'll go through and run my notebook for. So people don't even need to go to the code view, hit run, refresh everything, and then go back to the dashboard. It just goes and runs the related code, which again, pretty cool. Now, there's one little extra trick. It's finished updating, it's nice. Uh, which is, you know, I can't just have Viz, but what you can do is you can pin Markdown. So in this case, I've got the advancing Databricks logo at the top, and say, so I want to pin that. Let's send that over to my dashboard. And then it's decided it doesn't want to sit. Well, that's rude. I think that's uh, refreshing my um, picture. But if you've got kind of little logos, things you're getting from Google Images, things you're getting from different places, you can start to pin some, um, some markdown in there. So let's just go and have a look. Why is that not working? Okay, I'll pin the text. It should be straightforward. There we go. So you can just, if you've got some markdown in your, um, in your notebook, you can kind of build that in. And again, normally works with pictures if they're accessible. It depends on the type of markdown we're using. I think I'm using markdown sandbox for that, which won't work, which is why. Let's have a look. Being naughty. Yeah, there we go. So if it's straightforward markdown, I think that should work a little bit better. And let's just do that and re add it in. There we go. Okay, so you can make actually nice, visual, quite adjustable dashboards. Then it's not going to replace your BI tools. You're not going to suddenly save a ton of money of licensing by not having any BI at all. But if you've got analysts who are just trying to produce a report, they're trying to just get at some facts and figures, and they want the flexibility of being able to dig into things you've registered in Hive, to write a few queries, to pull in some CSV and mash it together and actually have the power of Spark doing all that together. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Really nice. So yeah, I just wanted to take a little time to to share that with you guys and go, you know, it's better than you think. Um, and that always surprises people. Whenever I go through that in a training session or I'm just talking to people going, hey, have, you, have you seen how much there is actually just in there, out of the box for free, which is really, really, really cool. So yeah, that's my number one tip for if you are an analyst or you're trying to I guess almost convince analysts that it's a really cool platform for them to be using and it gets them in a place where they can interact directly with the data, that they're using something that actually has real power behind it. Because how often do we have to take 
you know, millions and millions of rows, so like terabytes of data, and then squeeze it and shape it and squidge it into some kind of semantic model so that a BI tool can interrogate it. And yeah, you need that stuff. You absolutely need to have a semantic model to service kind of complete business users, and there's a whole persona of people uh, that that makes a lot of sense for. But the kind of middle ground people, the people who are really data savvy, who are happy writing a bit of SQL, who want to kind of get in and explore the data, I mean, the semantic model is a little bit too tied down for them. It's a little bit too prepared and modeled. But then maybe going into full-fledged, here you go, you have to learn Python, you have to write PySpark, you have to consider about how we're building data frames. If you've registered a lot of tables in, C in SQL, in the Hive layer, and then you let them loose with this kind of thing, they can actually make really rich dashboards, really decent like papers writing up, I found this, I did this experiment, this is what I found, baking the visuals inside it with the code hidden away, but it's still rerun up. It's really, really kind of cool. So we're gonna see this get even better when we see the release of Redash. So Redash and its integration into this, we're yet to see how that's gonna work, but hopefully it's gonna just complement it, make it a little bit nicer, make it a bit cooler. Uh, and I'm definitely super excited in terms of how that's gonna fit in. But if you haven't already, please just take a look at some of the visualization options you can do. Get a sale, do a display, get some output, hit that chart button and go, oh, I didn't realize how much stuff is in there. And then try making some dashboards. And it's, it's pretty cool. Even if you're an engineer just building a load of ETL, at the end of your ETL, if you're gonna spit out some stats about the number of bad rows, the number of good rows, the overall latency, how long the processing took, all that kind of stuff, you can just have it refresh a little chart at the bottom. It's not gonna add a huge amount of time onto your ETL, maybe a second or two while it refreshes that. And then your support guys, when they go into it, when they see what happened in that run, they've got that little breakdown embedded inside of your ETL scripts, which is awesome. All right, so that is the end of my rant for today. Um, if you like it, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Uh, I'll put another video up for you to check out. But yeah, otherwise, let me know how you get on and I'll see you next time. Cheers, guys.